You're listening to Zen Sandwich, a podcast for the independent mind and anyone who embraces life despite its absurdities. Join former attorney and professor turned Japanese papermaker Mark Reed each week as he talks with creative, inspiring, and influential people, or as he shares his own research to help make your world a little better today than it was yesterday. Well, one is an expert in AI, and the other is an expert in everything else. I, uh, I, I see him smiling already. Just I, for the record, just for the record, <laughs> I owned a software company, and the I was a people. programmer. <laughs> oh, okay, well, you've got techie experience. That is worth noting. Okay. However, okay, so I jest, but Brendan Bushy is someone I respect very much. I've been on his show, which is on YouTube, uh, several times now, and while we pretty much align on most things politically and even philosophically, our crossfire moments come vis-a-vis optimism versus pessimism. I accuse Brendan of being too doom and gloom sometimes. That's why I chose him for the counterpoint today. We need a good devil's advocate every now and then. So while we start with a narrowly defined question that I'm going to pose in a second here, the bigger question that really looms in the background behind everything we discussed today is this. Do the potential positives of AI outweigh the risks that are involved? We'll be talking about that along the way, but we start here. You see, here's what happened. And here's where I bring Corey into the conversation. Corey was on my podcast a few months ago. During our conversation, Corey mentioned that they, the AI creator folks, are already working on programs where if you could feed it enough data points, you could virtually recreate your deceased grandmother and have a conversation with her. Okay, I ran that clip of him saying that as a promo to our episode, and it blew up. So many people were creeped out by the thought. <laughs> Here's the thing. Creeped out or not, I can see it. My grandmother is deceased, and if I fed into AI that was developed for this purpose, enough info from images and video to sound recordings to whether she preferred crunchy or creamy peanut butter, if I could feed enough info, I can imagine that AI could pretty much get close to virtually recreating the sounds, the likeness, and even how she might say or decide something. Let's put aside the creepiness argument because that's not really relevant. The question remains, will AI ever be able to replicate human consciousness? That's the question we start with. Corey, you had your hand up. What do you want to say? There is AI already that can read our thoughts. And very recently, they did an experiment with a man who'd been paraplegic for over a decade that was able to have an AI bridge built between a spinal implant and a brain implant that could read his thoughts. And after only several weeks, he was able to walk even without those signals being transmitted. But I say that to say this, with haptic suits, with some of the different experiences that are being offered now in augmented reality, the data is getting so good that it can recreate the past and the future. So you don't even need to tell it if your grandmother liked creamy or crunchy peanut butter. <laughs> right? It, it can it can amalgamate so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points, including your own thoughts, your own memories, and those of others. And it becomes this kind of acoustic uh, record, right? This, this collective consciousness where especially once everything is on a blockchain and can be verified. Hmm. It's just going to be second nature. Quantum computing is probabilities, possibilities, potentialities, right? And so once you get these models getting smarter every day and then effectively every second, all of this is possible. Well, Brendan, I know that you don't think human consciousness is able to be replicated. What it's are not- your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Why? What, how do you define and measure consciousness? I think there's a difference between understanding what you can do with a really powerful computer or, or a whole string of really powerful computers wired together. Um, you can feed it a lot of data. You can get incredible amounts of information back rapidly. But that doesn't equate out to consciousness. The 
consciousness is something else. When if if you are, what is it then? I mean, what, how do we define the difference between consciousness and just decision making? No one programmed me. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> arguable. Okay. Indoctrinated, <laughs> yeah. indoctrinated from birth, but not programmed. You're not going to get anything out of a computer that you're not putting into it. And you can put into it a, a sequence of, of paths for it to follow when it's going on a given task. Mm-hmm. But that's not consciousness. Well, let me it's ask not- you, I don't Go mean ahead. to cut you off, but let me let me Go set ahead. up a, a hypothetical scenario. Have you seen the movie The Truman Show? Yeah. Okay. So let's say, let's say you were living in, you had been living in the Truman Show, that you've been videotaped, recorded your entire life, every decision you've made. And so let's say that information was just at, in real time, just pumped into an AI uh, program. Um, You don't think that it could recreate basically, I don't know how you're going to act, how you're going to think. I mean, what you're actually even going to think about. It could give you an. It could give you a rendering of how you might react in a given thing, but it's 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 not intuiting anything. It's it's simply taking data and applying it in a way it was programmed to apply it. My counter to that, I don't mean, and Corey, if you can jump in any time, but my counter to that would is how is that any different than what we do anyway? Aren't we just kind of we're programs like you just you said Mark, before, Mark? Mark, yeah. let me jump in then. Please. If that was the case, marketing wouldn't work, right? Marketers wouldn't be able to market to people if they couldn't anticipate things, mm. right? This is what data opens up the potentiality for. Well, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk don't think we're living in base reality anyway, and none of us remember being born, and we all have these electrodes and synaptic connections, and our brains and our hearts are motherboards. And so, you know, I think. Mark, to kind of your point for the episode, what is consciousness? And I've got a a seat on some boards and things like this where I'm looking at quantum computing and artificial general intelligence, Or, right? These computers can be taught exactly what it means to be conscious and not, to be cognizant and not, to be sentient and not. Google and some of these other companies have had to pull their programs because they have found it's too easy to have a computer not only know that it's on or off and overloaded or underloaded and overwhelmed, but right, these become data points. And, you know, whether or not we believe that we're living in base reality, whether or not we believe that we're already robots or, right, the the reality is I can create a photorealistic avatar using Unreal Engine right now, and I can train it on everything that I think is fundamentally true, untrue, fun, not fun, right, all of these things. And if I can upload my consciousness there and then go get on a, on a jet and go to Mars while my consciousness on Earth is experiencing itself and I come back and it's re-uploaded and it's me again. And, you know, we can look at the quantum effects of the you know observer effect and all of these things. But if I come back and get the same experiences that I had when I wasn't here, right, is that real or isn't? And I do believe that gray area is, is the area that we're as humanity entering right now. You're posing a question that can't be answered right now. Right? So you're drawing a conclusion on a hypothetical. If I went to Mars, that question could be answered when, and if you go to Mars and come back. So I don't find that, you know, persuasive. Um, I mean, I have to ask this. Have you ever programmed? Oh yeah. Okay, in what? How did you program? What languages did you use? Well, I, I've had all kinds of tech stacks. So Python, you know, C sharp. These, these are proficiencies of mine. But I've had uh, tech stacks that have spanned dozens and dozens of languages. I was doing HTML and JavaScript back in the '90s. So, you know, I, I understand a lot of the the binary stuff. Where I get really excited is the non-binary stuff, <laughs> right? The the it's not a one or a zero. I, the, if it's going through a computer, it's a one or a zero at any given moment. Well, Brendan, right. my question to get to to get away from the techie stuff because most of us are not uh, don't speak those computer languages, uh, Brendan. But how are we not just computers 
by by definition too, don't we just we've been we've taken in the data points when we when we're a baby, we learn what a banana is, what a what a table is, or whatever. We learn language. We're speaking English right now. You know, we le- we develop concepts. We input data, and then we export it in our decisions and the things we say, the way we talk. I have a southern accent because I grew up in Alabama, right? I, I, you know, that's part of who I am. How is that any different than than what we're talking about with AI? I haven't seen a computer kill itself. Oh, the go- the Google robot just tried to. Oh, really? Was it programmed to? <laughs> <laughs> nope. So so and and actually didn't try to kill itself, but it was programmed. It was an Amazon employee that was a robot. At a certain point, it just fell over, keeled over, stopped working because it realized it was doing the same thing over and over and over and it didn't want to. That didn't promote growth. Okay. I did just quick some. Maybe you're familiar with these people. Jeffrey Hinton. I was going to bring him up later. Yes. He's the uh, godfather of AI or one of them. His latest thing I've read from him is it's not as powerful as the human brain. Doubts it ever will be. Um, How about... Let's stick with Hinton for a while. And I, I know you got your notes there, uh, Brendan. But uh, yeah, the I sent you both a BBC article about a month ago uh, when it came out that he now he's considered a godfather of AI and uh, he warns of the dangers as he quit Google. He says he regretted his work. He said that right now what we're seeing is things like GPT-4 eclipses a person in the amount of general knowledge it has and eclipses them by a long way. In terms of reasoning, it's not as good, but it does already do simple reasoning. And given the rate of progress, we expect things to get better quite fast. So we need to worry about that. Uh, What he's referring to is bad actors that will utilize AI for bad things. You can imagine, for example, Putin you know, decides to give robots the ability to create their own sub goals. Um, The scientists warn that this will eventually uh, create sub goals. Like I need to get more power. So he's come to the conclusion that that kind of intelligence we're developing is, is, is very different than the intelligence we have. I mean, what, I guess, Corey, what would you say about, about that? What are the ethical implications of AI development? What I've been saying for a year or more is that we need everything minted on the blockchain. If we know where everything came from, if there's a digital record on a, you know, immutable ledger, we will be okay. We simply need sources of truth. I understand that there are a lot of people that worry that, you know, an agent GPT or, you know, these autonomous agents that don't even make us need to know how to prompt AI anymore are are going to take things over. And I do hope. 100% believe that AI will take over most jobs in the next probably 12 to 18 months. I think most people will not be needed to do anything that they're getting paid to do right now in the next 12 to 18 months. Good news is technology doesn't need money or our paychecks. So as long as there's a redistribution, as long as, and and that's my my big initiative and has been for some time, is uh, unconditional basic income using technology to generate enough money to provide humanity so that they can live the quality of lives that they wanted uh, to sustain before technology. But I'm not worried about it overtaking us. It was made by people. And as long as we're still at a point as humanity where we can keep it on the rails, right? Mm -hmm. These are smart contracts. These are programming languages. Things are very much put into silos of what can and cannot be executed. Now, Unfortunately, and I think it's probably where Brendan, people that, you know, like him that are way smarter than me get really, really scared is the guardrails aren't there right now. The fail safes aren't there right now. If we don't build them, then we're fucked because mm. tech can now build tech. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's if, the if kind of Terminator. Gives, yeah. Well, if it gives itself the goal to become way better and smarter and richer than humans so that it can overtake humanity. Right now, we don't have a way to prevent that, and that is scary. It's Mm -hmm. really, it's beyond scary, but we have to be proactive. Thank God we're still at a point where we can be proactive. Brendan, you wanted to say something? Yeah. When you first started this, this last stream, what you said, I believe, was consistent with what I was saying of how it's programmed. Oh, I see. In terms of... Of, can it be used for destructive purposes? Absolutely. Are people afraid it could be? Sure. I, I taught um, 
a graduate course in advocacy. This is years ago. And I was teaching graduate students about advocacy. Here, here's a progression you can go through. And one of the students stopped me and said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I'm teaching a course in advocacy. He said, but do you understand this can be used by bad actors? He didn't use bad actors, but that's what he what said. Saying, yeah. And I said, of course it can. I said, any anything can be used for a good purpose or a bad purpose. So, but I'm teaching advocacy. I'm telling you, you know, if you want to accomplish an end and you're looking to motivate politicians or people like that, this is a sequence you can go through. And he and he was saying, so what's to distinguish um, what you are teaching? Uh, or what's to prevent what you're teaching from falling into the hands of bad? I said, nothing. I said, there's nothing about the process of advocacy that is automatically used for good or automatically used for bad. I, I was a lawyer. I saw it used for good and bad. Right. I mean, and I left because it was used for bad so often. Anyway. And my thing to him was, it. I'm also teaching part of what I'm teaching. Every phase of the way is that you need to base what you're doing upon accurate, truthful information. So I'm, I'm putting a value in there, right? I'm, I'm saying his steps, but don't do this. Don't a- attempt to accomplish an end or an outcome by lying or disinformation. But if, if someone wants to em- employ lies and disinformation, they can, and they can use the same exact steps and attain a bad outcome. So, Brendan, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, some good insight. I was a metrologist in the 1990s. Metrology is the science of weights and measures. And so I would keep pipettes and digital balances and things of this nature within a compliance and a deviance of plus or minus tenth of a percent, hundredth of a percent, right? Whatever was deemed to be acceptable within that that particular test. And so accuracy is something that I'm really tuned into as well. I've been the global general manager for some years for a blockchain company called information.com, where we quite literally let people own all of their data the internet's ever aggregated about them and actually make money off it if they ever want money to be made off of it. And so a lot of what you're saying resonates with me. Where I kind of come back to right now, and it's timely, right? But at the moment, we have the opportunity and the potential, potentially as right, techies and entrepreneurs and, and, and these, these people that are literally creating the future of humanity, at the moment, we still have an opportunity to make sure that everything is done properly. But if we don't do things right right now, the cause for concern is very real. If we do, I'm not so concerned. If, if AI, right, and AI is hot right now okay like a few years ago bitcoin was hot and everybody talked about bitcoin you know ai is hot and everybody's talking about it if ai was as capable there's nothing we could do to stop it right because if ai was capable it could become a bad actor and it could get around anything we throw up to 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 stop it from doing whatever I'm saying it can't do that. I am saying it can be used for bad purposes. Put it on a blockchain now. Start to compile other AI and and generative AIs and things of this nature. All of a sudden, if we have a technology that can tell us where anything came from, and I've been beating the drum for a long time now about source of truth. We need to know where things came from. If I don't know if this video of Brendan Booski is actually Brendan Booski, then it's some scary shit. (laughs) <laughs> right. If, if it's your voice, because right now I could, and this is what's scary at the moment. I could, Brendan, the people watching, I want them to know I've never met you before. You're familiar to me for about 20 minutes of my life. Before the end of this weekend, I could write your autobiography and have it be fairly accurate. Then I could code for free a photorealistic <laughs> avatar of you, teach it your voice, because I'm sure you've given some keynotes. And I could literally have an avatar of you that looked like a video, speak your bio, your biography, and I could then give it some funny stories that I thought were great for people to think that Brendan Booski said that you never said, right? And it gets super scary. However, as long as it's on the blockchain and Brendan can come and say, hey, I never said that, I can prove it. 
at scale, right? On mass, that is where we just need to be. Um, and Mark, I know we've gotten a little bit off topic as far as like, <laughs> this is great. Can it never be fenced or conscious. But now that, well, I said at the beginning that, you know, essentially what we would be talking about, that was the starting point, but essentially we were talking about do the benefits outweigh the risks. And j- we only have a few minutes. I do just for the listener who might be scared <laughs> shitless right now uh, about the future. I do want to highlight some of the potential benefits of AI, like improved healthcare, more efficient transportation, increased productivity, more sustainable environment, enhanced education, improved security. There are, I do, I am in the camp at the moment that the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and, you know, you said something earlier, Corey, about, you know, there's risks in, there's always a risk in anything you do. Um, Mark, there's a risk in cars. They built a technology that can run a human being over and kill them. That's right. terrible, right? right? But it can get us wherever we want to go. Yeah. It's sort of a utilitarian perspective. You're going to lose some people in car accidents, but we're not going to all give up cars. For the greater good, we still use our cars. I'm not saying that the risks outweigh the benefit. I'm not even going there. Right. I'm simply saying that we can't recreate a, a Brendan Bushy. Hey, he just described. We don't need you anymore, Brendan. We'll just recreate you. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I, and and I'm also saying that the technology, whoever is handling the technology at the moment, controls the technology. So use for good or bad. And I'm also going to throw in here because you've alluded to it that. Um, Everything is being monetized. So, you know, you can buy data and stuff like that. That's being done for a reason, usually profit or to secure power, positions of power or what have you. Yeah. And in terms of advancements in technology, which I'm all for, okay, I make my living with technology. But every time we've had some big advancement, it's worked pretty much to the detriment of a large segment of people. So one of the things that happened with the automotive industry in this country was we we developed automation. We developed robots and they displaced all the people on the assembly line, okay? And that was done, that was done because it maximized profits for the people who own the automotive industry. And so when we get these technologies that can do things does it also bring down prices for the consumer too, though, since you can just pay, you can use robots instead of having to pay a human workforce and give them time off and all this stuff. You can just have robots work 24 seven. And eventually that brings the, I mean, supposedly it brings the cost down for the consumer. It does. It yeah. does. But what do you do with the worker? Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of now people we're back to get working. UBI. Corey, UBI. That's what, UBI. that's what Corey well, is like. You go back to universal we're, basic income. We're now looking at self-driving trucks. We no longer need truck drivers. <laughs> and a truck driver was only allowed to work nine hours a day or something like that. These self-driving trucks can work 24 hours a day and they have all these sensors. To me, if your entire livelihood was predicated upon being able to drive a truck and trucks can now drive themselves, your opportunity is to find something else to do. It's not to hold on to this, this, you know, hey, this is what I've done for 30 years. Cool. It's not needed anymore. Figure out anything else and or let tech make the money to give you so you can go to Disney World with your grandkids or whatever you want to do. If you're a trucker, maybe you want to get an RV and drive around the country, or, you know, whatever it is. But but I think there's a net positive or at least a, a potential for it. Well, Again, UBI, can you just say that out? What what was U- that? Universal after? basic income. Okay. So yeah. right now, there's a whole party who controls a lot of the country that wants to cut Social Security, that wants to cut Medicare, that wants to cut Medicaid. Where do you think, who's going to implement UBI? Well, <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it is, a, I mean, this is the last thing we'll say politically. It, it is uh Propose more on the democratic side of things. I mean, Andrew Yang's the first no. person I remember. Be- be- oh, no? Beautif- beautifully, it is nonpartisan. And this is what technology is opening up for right now. And it is, it, you can look it up right now. There, there have been billions of dollars deployed already in UBI. And this is literally the tip of the spear. 
That is good news. I will implemented. Hang on. I got I got to cut us off because this is the the oh. end of uh, what well, time we have. Uh let me just I tell the folks, thanks for listening. And uh, if you'd like to know more about Corey, you can follow him on LinkedIn. And uh, where else can they find you, Corey? Everywhere. But <laughs> the only place I'll notice him is on LinkedIn. Okay. I'll, I'll put that uh, link to your LinkedIn profile. There's a half a million people more. You're probably up to a million by now that follow you. And go check out Brendan Bushy's uh, show on YouTube. It's good stuff every time. I've been on there. I've been fortunate enough to be invited on there a couple of times. And uh, I think you can just find that by typing his name. I'll, I'll put a link to his channel. Um, and after you follow Corey and Brennan, head over to zensandwich.com and find out how you can help out this show. It's still a real human being running this show. Info on how to support the podcast is found at the top of the page. It's a listener-supported podcast, and we need your support to keep it going. Thank you both so much for your time, expertise, and thoughts today. I really appreciate it.